Hi everyone, this is Steve once again here with episode 3 of talking about bet structuring and betting on horse races. Uh, this isn't a, a tout page, I don't like to give picks on races, but I do like to talk about betting and different ideas that I've had over the years when it comes to betting and different concepts that I think are useful for betting on horse races. And today we're going to be talking about what I like to think of as the long shot paradox. And the long shot paradox is this. On average shorter prices, favorites in horse races, have a, ret a higher return on investment than longer priced horses. That is, if you bet every favorite in horse races, just every single race, you're going to bet on the favorite over and over and over again. Uh, you're going to have an ROI probably, a return on investment, that is higher than the takeout. Every uh, win pool, the track is going to take out something like 18% of the pool. So if you are to bet every horse, you would expect to lose about 18%. If you bet every favorite, you could expect to lose probably something closer to like 10% rather than 18%. So you can actually beat the takeout just by beat, uh, betting every favorite. You can't beat the races, you can't have a positive return on investment, but you can't beat the takeout that way. Because you can beat the takeout only betting on favorites, the opposite has to be true the other direction. You have a lower than expected payout if you were to just bet on long shots consistently. And in fact, the higher the price of the horses you get down into 20, 25, 30 to 1, 40 to 1 type horses, the return on investment betting on those horses, just race in, race out, betting every single one that comes up is going to be absolutely atrocious. It's going to be much, much, much worse than the expected takeout, the expected 18% loss that you would have in the win pool. Despite that, most players who maintain a positive return on investment find that they get there through the longer priced horses, through the horses who on average you would expect to be substantially negative ROI plays. So rather than churning away at those horses where on average you'd expect them to be, uh, you know, you start right off the bat with like a 90% uh, ROI, and, you know, you lose a dime on every single favorite that you bet, and then you try to cherry pick the favorites that are better. You're already pretty close, and I can get over the edge just by getting the ones that I think are going to work. That tends not to be the way that it works, churning out small profits on favorites. Instead, what tends to happen for players is that they find on those longer price horses, those big scores with the 10 and 15 and 20 to 1 type horses, those are the ones that sustain a positive ROI over the long haul, despite the fact that on average those horses are very poor bets. That is the long shot paradox. The answer to that paradox is that because relatively small variances between what the public thinks of a horse, and that's where the odds are based off of how people are betting the horse, small variances between what the public thinks of a horse and what the horse's actual chances of winning the race are make a big difference in price and ROI for long shots, but don't make that big of a difference for favorites. Once you get into horses that are two to one, even money, even, uh, you know, shorter prices than that, substantial odds on favorites, you need to have big, big, big swings in what the public thinks about the race and what the actual chances are of the horse winning the race for there to be any sort of an edge. And even then, you're ultimately capped at the 100% chance that horse of, wins, of winning the race. So if you have an even money shot, and that means that the public is assigning a 50% chance, that horse can only have up to 100% chance of winning the race, which caps your potential for growth only at that even money. And of course, most horses aren't going to have a 100% chance. Almost no horse is ever going to have a 100% chance. So I wanted to show you how this all works graphically. And I whipped up a simple graph here. The uh, vertical axis is just the likelihood of a horse or a series of horses having a chance to win. And you can see the percentages on the right. The horizontal axis is races, and you can just imagine a series of races over time. We don't have to be too specific about it. And here we have a series of a couple of different types of horses. The first lines you see above are an even money shot. This is a horse that's being bet by the public at 50%, so exactly a 50% even money chance of winning. 
the actual average chances of those forces having to winning, we're going to assign uh, somewhat arbitrarily at 45%. So I talked before about how if you bet favorites on average, you could expect to get something like 90 cents back on the dollar for every dollar that you bet. And so I'm going to keep that ratio here. I'm not going to show my work on that, but you're just going to have to trust me that that's uh, pretty close to correct. Uh, so you see the red line at 45%, and that's going to be a situation where actually you get 95% uh, back on your investment for every dollar that you bet. So you're going to see you're going to lose a little bit of money over time betting on that favorite, but you're going to keep things relatively close. Down below, you're going to have an example of a long shot, series of long shots across these races. These horses are going to be 10 to 1 horses. The public is going to assign a 10 to 1 chance of winning, or I suppose that would be 9 to 1, somewhere in that range. These horses, we're going to say, have only a 5% chance of winning overall. So the public is assigned 10%. Uh, in actuality, the average one of these horses is going to have a 5% chance of winning. The same 5% spread, you can see, 50 to 45 and 10 to 5%, makes a big difference in terms of return on investment. For that first horse, that favorite, that even money shot, that's going to be a 95 cent return on investment for every dollar bet. Negative, uh, but still pretty solid and still something that's going to take you a long way. For the lower price, or for I should say for the longer priced horse, for the long shot, uh, that 5% spread is going to result in only 50 cents return per dollar bet. You're going to lose your money very, very, very quickly betting on those horses. Out of every 20 races, you're only going to cash one of them, and you're going to lose 19, and you're only going to get 10 to 1 back on that. You're going to lose a lot of money chasing not very much, despite the fact that you're going to get 10 to 1 every time that you win. That's using the same 5% spread, the same 5% uh, inefficiency between what the public thinks and what the, actual, the horse's actual chances of winning are create this big spread. But you can imagine, just because a horse has an average, you know, these horses, these even money horses, on average have a 45% chance of winning, or these 10 to 1 horses on average have a 5% chance of winning, doesn't mean that every single even money shot is going to be 45%, and every single 10 to 1 shot is going to be 5 to 1. You can imagine instead that there's going to be a spread in that variance. Some of them are going to be lower than that, and some of them are going to be higher than that. And the whole point of handicapping is to try to cherry pick those horses that have, have the, the chances, the even money shots that get above that line. So here I threw together two red boxes. This is intended to show the range of variance possible for these types of horses. You can see the horizontal red line, that's where we had it before. I left that in the same places, the 45% for the even money, the 5% for the 10 to 1 shot. But we also have these boxes showing the total range of possibilities for horses that could be even money or 10 to 1. This isn't scientific, but it's just meant to be an example. We can imagine that over a series of races, some even money shots are going to have as high of a chance as 70% chance to win. Some even money shots are going to go as low as 35% and then anywhere in the middle there. Similarly, for the 10 to 1 shot, we can imagine some 10 to 1 shots having as high as 20% chance of winning and some having practically no chance of winning, a red line that goes almost all the way to the very, very bottom of the scale. The way that I've drawn these is that the red box for the favorites is actually larger, it encompasses more percentages, than the red box for the long shot. This, uh, the red box for the long shot only goes from 20% to 0%. The red box for the favorites goes all the way from 70% to 35%. And the red box for the favorites goes a full 20% above the break-even point, above the even money point, whereas the box for the long shot that I've made here, and once again, this is somewhat arbitrary, goes only 10% above the break-even point. So I've kind of juiced things in favor of the favorite, trying to show how much you need to show to have that sort of edge on a favorite. If you cherry-pick the very best horses within this range, the ones that are fully 70% chance of winning, this is I'm talking about the even money shot now, the ones that have 70% chance of winning, you're only going to have a 40% edge of 40% return on your investment. That's not bad. I would certainly take it. I'd be more than happy with that. But it's going to show how things are going to cap out very quickly. You can only get there only even with very, very, very good even money bets. If you look below at the long shots, here is where I've only allowed the 
range to go 10% above what the public's odds assigned are. Despite that, the fact that we've only gone 10% above versus 20% above in the favorite example, we have a 100% edge. We're winning 20% of our races at 10 to 1 versus 70% of our races at even money. We're going to get twice our money back despite the fact that there's less variance overall for the long shots than there is for the favorites. Those little bits of variance make a big, big difference when it comes to the odds. Another important thing I want to note is that your eyes can deceive you. Your sense of how you're doing can deceive you when you think about things in this mindset. Uh, I was showing you before at the very tops of the ranges, but I want to think of for a little bit about the top of the long shot range versus the bottom of the favorite range. So the very, very best bets you can make on long shots and the very worst bets that you can make on favorites. Even if you're making the very, very best bets you can in this example for these boxes on these 10 to 1 shots, you're only going to win 20% of the time. If you're making the very worst bets, so you're only making you're only making terrible handicapping decisions on these even money shots, you're still going to win in the example I provided at a 35% chance, so almost twice as much just on a pure hit rate sort of example. How often am I cashing tickets? You're not making money back. You're losing 30 cents on the dollar compared to making $2 back for every dollar bet. But you're still cashing tickets regularly, and you're still doing better than, in this example, what you would be doing if you were just betting on every long shot mechanically. If, remember, uh, the example we provided here has the long shot chances at 5%, the odds at 10%, which means you're losing 50% of your money. You have a negative 50% edge, whereas here, if you're betting all the worst favorites, you have only a negative 30% edge. And so this is, I think, the trap that a lot of horse players fall into, especially beginning horse players, that if you stick to favorites, you're going to see more money come back. You're going to cash more tickets. You're going to actually go to the windows or see more money go into your account more regularly, and that feels good. But your actual edge is still going to be somewhat better than if you're betting a lot of long shots because you haven't refined your own handicapping abilities to be able to pick out those ones that are better. So you're going to get a lot of negative reinforcement about betting long shots, and I think that it instills a lot of bad habits. But you need to keep in mind that it's those instances where the uh, actual chances of a horse winning for a long shot really vary from the public perception of that horse that's going to allow for the really big edges that uh, sustain you through the uh, you know the long stretches of poor opinions that everyone is going to have. You can't let yourself fall into that trap of just looking at percentages of hit rates. Um, you need to remember where your gains are going to come from, where that positive ROI is going to come from, and it's going to come from the long shots, even if on average uh, most long shots can be very bad bets. So I think there's some conclusions that we can draw from all of that. The first conclusion, and I can't stress this enough, is that you can't bet scared because most of the time, the uh, races where you're going to have a very, very substantial edge are going to come in races where you're unlikely to cash a ticket, even if you're completely right. And we can go back to the previous example there. Even if I'm completely 100% right about the fact that the uh, 10 to 1 shot in any given race has a 20% chance of winning, and then I have a 100% edge in that race, I'm still not going to cash 4 out of 5 tickets. So I can't be afraid of losing a bet. It's just not going to work. I have a related conclusion that I think is useful. Um, a really bad habit that I see from a lot of people is not building their bankroll up to a sufficient level before they bet. And when I say a sufficient level, I don't mean that you necessarily need to have thousands or tens of thousands of dollars saved. But what you do need to do is you need to have more than a single day's worth of races, a single day's worth of betting, either on hand or in your account or whatever you use as your bankroll. And the reason for that is because if you have only that day's betting on hand, or you have only a little bit of money on hand, uh, define a little bit of money however you like, you're going to be less likely to take those chances 
when you find a horse that's a long shot but that you think has a better chance of winning than the public is perceiving that horse to be because you're going to be afraid of losing that bet. If I make this bet and I'm wrong, even if it's a good bet, I'm going to make it. I have a better chance of not cashing than I do of cashing. I'm going to lose that money. And then how am I going to get myself through the rest of the day? And you see this a ton. We go to the racetrack with people and there's a horse that they really like in race three. Um, but they don't necessarily want to bet it because they have a whole day of racing coming up and they want to make sure that they have money left over for the feature and the reason why they went there. And they're not willing to take those chances on the horses on the edges where they find them. That's a bankroll issue. If you're someone who doesn't have a lot of money, and I started that, I'm still that way, but I still don't bet a huge amount of money, but I was certainly once a, a broke high school and college student doing this, uh, take a few weeks off, take the $20 or the $50 that you would play on a Saturday card and just put it away. Wait until uh, you know a, a particular meet comes up. If you're getting, this is the summer now, I would say wait maybe until the Saratoga meet. If you're talking about the winter time, wait until the Kentucky Derby prep start or wait until the Churchill meet or, or whatever target you have in mind as a horse player. Take that $20 or that $50 that you would bet on a weekly basis and just save it up for a couple of weeks. Watch the races, work on your handicapping, buy a form, see how your opinions are doing, see, see if you're refining your handicapping abilities in the meantime. One of my favorite things to do when uh, I was in school was I would have uh, HRTV back in the day or TVG on. I would sit in my living room and I'd have a form and I would have a mythical bankroll of such and such money and I would sit there handicapping the races and that was a way of overcoming the fact that I didn't have any money to bet. You can do the same thing in the meantime, but build up your bankroll and then be ready to fire with that bankroll when you have it. You don't have to make bigger bets, but just have that money in reserve so that if you have horses that are 20 to 1, you feel like you have a big edge on them. You can bet a certain percentage of your bankroll on that horse. And if you're wrong about that, or if you miss on that, you're right, but the horse doesn't win. You don't feel like it's a big setback. You're not afraid to take those chances. So build your bankroll before you bet. Conclusion number two from all this is that Long shot return on investment is high variance, but that doesn't mean that you can get away from, uh, you can just chalk everything up to chance. You still need to be honest with yourself about whether you're picking the long shots that really are uh, higher chances of win than the odds are allowing, or whether you're making bad bets. So if I go back to that 10 to 1 example, where the horse actually has a 20 or might potentially have a 20% chance of winning. Even if I'm right, I'm going to be losing a lot of bets, but I need to know whether or not I'm right or whether or not I'm wrong. I had uh, two bets yesterday. I, I won't talk about the specifics of it, but I had two long shots that I really liked yesterday. One of them I was right about and one of them I was wrong about. Uh, not only was I wrong because the horse lost, but the horse really had no chance. And I was completely wrong about the fact that I thought that the horse had a better chance than the odds allowed. I mean, that's something I need to be honest with myself about. How often am I picking those sorts of horses that had no chance versus those horses where I was adequately taking the odds into account, but I just didn't get the bit of racing luck or the breaks that I was counting on needing to get that edge. You need to be consistently honest with yourself. At the same time, don't beat yourself up on a race-to-race -race basis. You can't, uh, people ask a lot of times, you know, how am I doing after a day of races? There's too much variance to account for that. If you bet on 10 or 15 races, there's just not enough of a sample size to know specifically whether or not you're sustaining yourself at that level. So it's a game of much longer swings than that. So take individual races seriously, hold yourself to account, um, but do recognize that there's going to be a lot of variance. The final thing I'll say is that the same lessons I'm talking about here in the wind pool also apply in vertical exotics, exactas, trifectas, superfectas. Very, very short odds combinations in those pools are going to actually pay a higher ROI than the longer combinations. And that's because all of the combinations in the pool tend to get covered and because the uh, chances of the really long combinations coming in are so are, are just so so high that it takes very very little money for there to be a negative ROI on it. So if you were to just bet favorite over second choice in the exacta pool, race after race after race, you would actually do kind of okay, at least relative to takeout. You wouldn't win money, but you do okay relative to takeout. If you just bet the very, very longest combinations, uh, you're occasionally going to catch huge bombs, but you're going to have a lot of losses in the meantime, a ton of losses in the meantime, and it's not going to make up for it. It's not even going to uh, uh, 
make up for the relatively small gap that you would have if you were betting on the favorites. So the same lessons apply there. The same lessons of variance apply there, if not more so, because the variance gets so wild when you talk about the long odds of trifectas and superfectas and stuff like that. Um, they're harder lessons to apply in exotic pools. There's more range for chance. You need to have a higher tolerance for variance, a higher tolerance for seeing your bets go away. Um, but you can apply the same lessons here, and it's still, I think, a useful frame for thinking about betting on the races, thinking about betting on long shots, and thinking about betting on value. That is all that I have today. A little bit of a longer video today, but I think a, a, a useful topic to discuss. I plan on doing a couple more of these videos, maybe a few more of these videos, episodes on bet structuring, and I hope that you've enjoyed this series. Um, pretty soon after that, I'm going to be having some more videos on the bet tracking spreadsheet that I have for MS Excel. I would encourage you to check out the videos on that. If you are someone who's getting involved in horse racing that's looking for a way to track their betting, uh, I think that it's a very, very useful program, and I'd be more than happy to send it to you free of charge. If you email me at horsebettracker at gmail.com, I will send you a copy. It's also a number of betting tools as part of that spreadsheet. I have a exacta and trifecta calculator. Uh, I have all sorts of analytical tools. I've got a multi-ticket wagering calculator, similar to like the DRF ticket maker function that allows you to put together pick four and pick five and pick six tickets. You can find all of those videos on my channel. If you like this video, uh, if you liked any of the videos that you've seen, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, please uh, watch the other videos. Please like or comment uh, down below. I'm always happy to hear from people, always happy to hear from people reaching out for the spreadsheet or emailing me about the videos. Um, uh, it's been a lot of fun doing this for the past year or so, and I've gotten more feedback and uh, more people asking for the spreadsheet than I've anticipated, which is always a lot of fun. Um, so do not hesitate to do that. If you've enjoyed the videos, uh, once again, subscribe. Email me at horsebettracker at uh, gmail.com. Uh, until then, uh, I hope that you have a good day of racing, and I will talk to you again soon.